Packard 12 or a Cadillac 16 or a Duesenberg. You never forgot it. Everybody just was in awe of those things. Augie and Fred Duesenberg had a tremendous reputation for building the best racing cars on the market. And they'd won some significant races. They built the first American car to win the French Grand Prix. The Duesenberg brothers built three cars that won the Indy 500. And then went on to produce a passenger car, the Duesenberg Model A. The first Duesenbergs weren't very pretty, but they were powerful. Straight eight engine, single overhead camshaft. A very modern design. This is a car that'll run down the road at 65 miles an hour, which doesn't sound a whole lot today, but if you consider that's a 1927 automobile, this was a very, very fast car. But the superlative cars, the classic Duesenbergs, those dazzling cars that today cost well over a million dollars, were created in partnership with an entrepreneur. A Midwesterner with a spectacular sense of style, E.L. Cord. It was the marriage of Duesenberg chassis and engines with individually styled and handmade bodies that produced some of the most powerful and beautiful automobiles in the world, the Duesenberg Model J. It was a glamorous car that appealed a lot to movie stars and to people of uh, ambition. With a price tag starting at $17,000, the Model J was built to outclass, outrun, and outlast any car on the road. Duesenbergs were bought mainly by the um, very flamboyant, as flamboyant as the car was itself. There were very few dowagers who owned Duesenbergs. Gary Cooper owned a Model J. In fact, he owned two. So did Greta Garbo and the King of Spain. Clark Gable courted Carol Lombard in this car at 130 miles an hour. It was just awesome. It was so powerful compared to the other ones. When they, when they were busy talking about 100 or 160 horsepower, a Duesenberg had 265 horsepower. The standard model. And then they supercharged it as if that wasn't enough, and it pulled 320 horsepower. Those cars would do 100 miles an hour in second gear. <laughs> and of course, and then everybody said, well, what will it do in high? Nobody knows. Gosh, there isn't a road big enough for it. <laughs> so the, the expression, it's a doozy, was set in the way those cars were perceived by people. It's a doozy. It was the jazz age. Mores were changing, women bobbed their hair, you saw the rise of the flapper, men looking like lounge lizards, everybody smoking cigarettes. And with this change in values, the automobile provided just the right vehicle. We were becoming a true consumer society. People bought not only out of necessity, but for the sheer pleasure of buying. Consumers could now choose among 72 different model cars produced by General Motors. The most expensive, the most elegant, was the Cadillac. Automobiles in those days, certainly much more so than today, gathered their own following. I mean, if you were a Packard man, you were a Packard man until the day you died, and beyond, most likely. The Packard brothers sold cars for the discriminating. Their ad spoke of conquest and leadership. Packard did a series about how many senators owned Packards, uh, uh, how many governors, and how many ambassadors who took their Packards over with them to wherever they went. And a, a Packard was considered the, the car that said you were wealthy, but didn't say it quite as loudly as a Duesenberg did. Very, very interesting cars were being born in the late 20s and early th 30s but most people didn't even see one. If you are lucky enough to live in New York or Chicago or, or Hollywood, you saw them, but, but most people never even saw them. They saw pictures of them. Out in Detroit in 1927, Henry Ford, who had said he didn't give a damn about style, was forced to admit that the rest of the country did. In July, 
He told a reporter, 64 years today, and the biggest job of my life lies ahead. For months, all Ford plants in the U.S. had been shut, while Ford worked in secret to come up with a new car. When he abandoned the Model T, he did not have a successor car in place. The fact that Ford discontinued that car without a, a replacement vehicle uh, must be classed as one of the great business blunders in automotive history. That was, that was a really disaster. And what it did is it started somebody else, Chevrolet, finally passed Ford is the largest selling car, something that nobody thought would ever happen. Ford dealers were going bankrupt, others defecting to GM. Rumors about Henry's new model surfaced in the press. Retooling was costing a million dollars a day. Ford refused to comment. Spring turned to summer, summer to fall. And there was tremendous speculation throughout the length and the breadth of the land. And uh, Henry Ford, rather than announce any plans that he might have, decided to let the press and the public speculate. I don't think that any product ever produced before or since the Model A has had so much free uh, publicity. Ford kept his plans secret, refused to unveil the car. There was an immense buildup of public anticipation waiting for the moment in which it would finally be revealed. On December 2nd, 1927, just outside the Ford plant, the Model A was finally introduced. That day in New York City, a quarter of a million people turned out to get a glimpse of the car that they had all been waiting for. Crowds blocked traffic throughout the metropolitan area. There were reports that in Detroit, 31,000 people were storming the convention hall. In small towns all over America, Ford representatives drove down Main Street to show off the car. Russell Poole remembers their arrival. All summer long, people were waiting to see what the Model A was like, and they didn't come out till late that fall. I remember people going to the showroom to see that first Model A. It was quite exciting. Within two weeks, almost a half million cars had been sold. By January, production couldn't keep up with demand. The Model A came in different styles and fabulous colors, with lacquer finish and fancy upholstery. In a reversal of strategy, Ford pitched the Model A to a swankier clientele. In some ads, there would even be chauffeurs and maids in the picture to suggest Model A was perfectly suitable for those of high social stature. Ford had done it again. He had produced a universally beloved car. Even today, Many collectors believe that the Model A was the best car ever built. Lauren Loudy is a fan. That was the car that I fell in love with. When I got older, like uh, the age I am now, I bought a 1930 Model A, which I happen to have in my garage. Completely restored, just like a brand new car. My dad would let me shift. He would work the pedals, but I was working the shift. He would put in the clutch, and I would put it up to second. He would put in the clutch, and I would put it down in neutral. He would put in the clutch, I'd put it down a third. You know? It was like a ballet between the two of us. And it was a lot of fun. It brings back a lot of memories. The Model A had scarce settled into the American landscape when the stock market crashed. In these troubled times, holding on to the car you owned became a national obsession. And the roads across America would become an endless source of cheap entertainment. Anybody that was interested in a life of doing no good saw the benefits of doing it by car. Driving Passion will continue on TBS.
By the 1930s, the American road, once an empty landscape, had been transformed into a giant theme park.